Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You cut out for just a second there. Oh, okay. Is Michelle joining us or? <laughs> I forgot to open source that. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah. That's an Apple sandbox. Is that Jeremy uh, with a finished I product? Like, all crumpled like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for I have some programming issues. I sent you an email last night. Wow. We've got the I.O. pretty much all checked out. We've got some end stop problems. They're operating um, opposite of what we would expect. Uh -huh. um, I, maybe we're on the wrong min or max. I don't know. Okay, okay. They work, but um, if they're open, if there's nothing touching them, then the bed won't move that direction. And if we hold them down, we can get, them, get the bed to move. Huh, okay. Um, let's see. How are you documenting that? Do you have anything on your log or anything like that? Uh, um, no, we, we were. We were at it very... It's just like, okay, we gotta go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. What what time uh, did you guys finish? Um, I I stepped out of my garage around ten o'clock last night. That's oh. great. Wow. <laughs> yeah. We put like some slack. Yeah. <laughs> well, we actually built the extruders here from scratch. So we were yeah. so we were up till what? One? Thirty or two. Yeah, but one or two. Like one. Yeah. Yeah, wow. but we're, we're, from, we're uh, we've got three printers here. That's great. Um, I would say um, okay. So you've got say you've got some outstanding issues. Um, okay, I'll approve you on. A, I think you said Facebook. You didn't get on there yet. But I mean, on your log. So you know, part of the collaborative thing is. Uh, so you start log. So Jeremy log on the wiki, and then put your yeah, put your issues there. We can respond to it. And ideally, would post pictures. I mean, Facebook is a good good thing to, to post up. Do you use Facebook? I, I have an account. I only use it occasionally on my computer. I'm not a huge Facebook user. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's always a, an issue where people don't want to use Facebook. But, but, um, I don't mind it. You use I can, mine. I can okay, use it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you, if you wouldn't mind so that we can actually communicate visually as well on top of... Uh, what you have, but yeah, I think uh, you, you can log to the wiki. Yeah, I'm, I'm ask, uh, requesting an account right now as we talk. Oh, okay, okay, so we can um, we can address all of that as we as we go because we'll start talking about collaboration and all of that. Let's have a report from the Richmond location. How are you guys there? Hey folks, good morning. Morning. Can you hear us okay? Or is yes. Okay? Yes, we can. We're just getting started on, on, on today. Uh, um, uh, yeah, yesterday we made some some good progress. Um, we are, are uh, a little bit uh, behind of, of the uh, curriculum, but we got the, um, pretty much all of the mechanics done on the printer, the control panel built, and the extruder about halfway built. Um, uh -huh. So we're having, uh, having a good time. We're learning a lot. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, today we're going to kind of back and forth between us. We're doing three, some pre-CAD, um, uh, but with the online running some prints on the other printers, we'll be build, finishing the uh, build uh, here as well. Okay, okay. And if you have any issues or anything, like how do we communicate? So lo work logs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to set up one of the first things. We're going to set up our work logs um, on the wiki, and so we can upload uh, our progress and, um, yeah, some questions too. Uh, we did run into a, a couple of issues with um, with some of the fitment and stuff, um, but we, we have been, been troubleshooting and uh, making good progress. Uh -huh. uh, I, I have a couple of questions on, on some of the wiring that we did since we pulled the SSR out of the circuit, uh, and I did have to uh, print out some of these linear bearings after all. On wow. The that we have. So, um, Are they actually... <laughs> Say again? Are they actually working? Have you tested them if they're moving? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've tested the friction of them and the fit and everything, and they have lower friction and better fit than uh, the uh, 
than that old, uh, or than the other plastic bearings. So the other plastic bearings that that, um, that came in the kit were uh, you hear that? Uh, they're too tight on the rods, and then also didn't fit into the um, they're too wide, or the an extra millimeter or two for the for the carriage. I'm not not quite sure, but so we harvested huh. some of the metal bearings that we um, um, uh, that you had previously sent, and then also we printed uh, printed. The okay, G- so, give us a give us a close up of that. Give me a close up of the bearing. So they, they're doing some innovation over there. Um, it does look better. Yeah, so uh, it's a pr- printed at zero, um, comp- uh, zero and a half. Hold it right there, yeah. It's exactly one layer. Curve. That's beautiful. Wow. Mm-hmm. I can't believe that, man. That's awesome. So I did uh, three or four Goldilocks fit test prints this morning to get it to get it uh, dialed in, but I don't even think it's going to be that loud. Um, you know, the other ones that we were testing on in, uh, in Missouri were it had a little bit too much noise going back yeah. and forth, but. I don't think it's going to be. A, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Wow! It, it, it nests, nests in with the prints as well, and the layer and the layer lines hold it good. So I don't know we're going to test it today um, um, as we're building the uh, this, uh, the second one in the shop B three D rebuilding that with these guys. Um, Excellent. Yeah, and so we'll see. Hold it up. Hold it up again. I want to take a look at take a picture of that again and show the profile. Show the profile and done. Yeah, take it, okay, take it out of there. Okay, look at that. Can I ask a quick question? What prompted um, the need to do that for you all specifically? Um, well, we had developed it a little bit in uh, in, in uh, Missouri in November while we were just talking about the, uh, refining the, you know, the, the bed for the next B3D. And uh, it was, honestly, it was kind of one of those <laughs> reduce the part count, reduce the cost. And when you, when you take a, a component that has been... Um, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, a proprietary linear bearing. You don't have really the same control over it. If you want to change the dimensions slightly, yeah. if you want to, uh, uh, you know, if you, if the players change, I mean, that way you'll be able to. Cool. Just more control. So we were running into some problems. We had to do a lot of heating and squishing for ours. They're in selfie mode, uh, but we had to do a lot of heating and squishing for ours and. I'm curious uh, if we had had those plans, we could have, you know, at least built one, printed a bunch of out, reassembled the rest of them. Now, granted, obviously, that's such a core component, it'd be hard, but um, yeah, it's cool. Pretty deep in there um, to, yeah. to change out, but um, yeah, that's that was we were going back and forth too. Uh, how are we going to get these to fit? So I, I guess did you have these um, other plastic? It fit okay around the, the, the Correct. extrusion, but yeah, then to fit into here, it was just it was cracking. In. Yeah, so heat forming is one is definitely one way to to, to fix that and get the fit and better than dremeling. But um, I'll post these plans on my blog. Um, uh, yeah, uh, right away. Is Thanks. that uh, Chris? Is that the file that we used exactly as from before, or did you modify it? <clears throat> no, I modified a little. I, I tweaked some of the parameters and re open scat. I uh, ran it through open scat again. Um, just uh, to, to get the the right fit in, uh, in at least uh, in the carriage parts that I have. That's I awesome. Same, um, but I did change I did change it from from what it was on. That's what's currently on the on the. Mm-hmm. Wow! Great innovation, Chris. Awesome. Uh, we actually um, had a lot of issues here because I you know I p- printed all the parts with 1.2 nozzles and then the carriages were all super tight, so we had to do a lot of the uh, heat gunning to make it loosened up. But we've got all the, you know, the, we finished the printers and all of that, so that was good. But that, that actually ate up a whole bunch of time. I mean, that was, yeah. we probably wasted like two at hours. At least, yeah. Man, yeah, it was pretty terrible as far as, <laughs> as that. Uh, did you run into any of that, or you're, you're printing at small nozzles? Right. That's <laughs> kind of impressive, right? Yeah, you know, I did most of my, my printing at, um, I mean, uh, the lower resolution than uh, a fairly low resolution, but not as far and lower, than, not as, as thick layers. I think these were run at maybe 0.35 um, layering. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, the only tolerance that issues really that we had was uh, was with the, with the linear bearings. Yeah, you know, we went anything else. I think everything else kind of. Uh, so what was what was actually wrong with the bearings? Oh, I had a point. So basically, they don't. They, it's not able to close all the way around the, the radius, and them just seem to be. Yeah. 
uh, either it was then putting too much tension on and clamping down on the rods and it wouldn't it wouldn't slide. Oh wow! Either it was gonna be loose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Either it was gonna be loose or huh. uh, too, too clamped. Yeah. Well, for the future, like wow. So see, we should have been. Uh, collaborating more, more closely on that because if you had that maybe we could have printed them out oh, except yeah. we don't have working printers here yet the, the, but, uh, <laughs> the, the other thing is if you have if you want uh, linear bearings in there but you're already printing there's somebody that's going to hold it plus you're printing linear bearings to go in there why not just integrate it make it all one assembly you know like yeah um, Chris what are your thoughts on that uh, what do you mean as one uh, you mean as, as one so, as one single print yeah yeah. So the only replacement parts. So uh, yeah, replacement because they, uh, um, they are printed the same orientation that that could uh <laughs> grind it. They could. So I do, uh, the only thing that comes to mind is that I would want to print these at slightly different uh, settings. Is that this one could be printed at a much lower resolution, much faster, and this one um, I've been printing them at at a, at a higher resolution for uh, smoother, you know, uh, for smoother interior and I guess less friction. But that, that I. I uh, just a theory. I mean, I don't know. It, it's that's quite possible. Um, if we printed it all as one piece, it would they would I guess print uh, one would be like this and one would be without. Right. Yeah. 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 It's doable. There's uh, some. Oh, yeah. No, that's the other thing. Right now, wow. this is designed for um, for uh, printing in shell mode. So uh, if you look at the STL file for this, it's it's not a, a hollow model. It's a completely solid uh, object. Yeah, yeah. And to then print it with special settings. So getting a, a getting Cure to print only one single layer uh, walls is is kind of tricky, and so <laughs> that, that, I guess that's the technical constraint. But in, in theory, if we could get the right G code, we could print it as one. Well, it's still two pieces, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's see. What are you guys up to today? You've got your hands full on finishing up the printer. <laughs> And then you're pretty good because we were going to go over the the pre-CAD lesson uh, here. We did want to talk about the general collaboration procedure, uh, what we have for that. Uh, Jeremy, uh, maybe. Well, let's let's actually cover that. And I don't know what happened. What happened to Michelle? I, I suspect they might still be. I don't know what's happening to them. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what what's happening to them. But um, can we go over a little bit? Um, on the collaborative literacy part, then, uh, just just for everybody's reference for how we collaborate, because the big day for today was, well, the big concept was we were, with the printers, we're going to start iterating on designs. We can print the, for example, the pen plotter. Uh, we can print the motor holder for the CNC uh, drill. So we can start applying this platform to, to everything. And we can start generating G code, like manually is probably a good thing to show people how to do that manually, and then extract it from other software like um, like Inkscape. We can use Inkscape to generate G code, for example. Um, so the main thing, just just as far as the page on the wiki that I want everybody to be aware of. So uh, wiki. So the page is called OSC Collaboration Protocol, I think. is Was that the page? Let's see. Boratium. Yeah. Yeah, I want to go over this just this page really quickly. It's kind of a summary of the big picture collaboration. Chris, you're familiar with it quite a bit since we have done that in live a lot. So for large scale collaboration, what you need to watch out for is that you know, why don't people do it is, I mean, you're coordinating large groups of people with different interests and different skill sets, different ways of being and so forth. So definitely the concept of collaborative waste comes up and you know collaboration does not happen in a proprietary world where one company <coughs> tries to beat another for its business. We're not in a generally collaborative setting, but if we choose so we can and we can get unprecedented amounts of collaboration now with internet tools into 
uh, talking about solving problems, really. That's, that's what it's after. Uh, that's what we're about. Um, taking any of the issues that plague society today and an idea being that when more people put their head around it, you can, you can solve the problems, starting with the very, very basics, which are still material security. I mean, most of the people are, how many people on the planet? 50% or more. Um, I mean, what are, what are the statistics there? But um, a vast number of people, and it's probably more than half, I mean, still don't have their basic needs met in this incredibly abundant world where we have incredible technology and abundant energetic income, as I mentioned yesterday, coming from the sun, we're, we're like, what's happening to, to our species as a whole that we can't solve basic issues like that? And part of that is uh, the mindsets of people, the scarcity mindset that we're trying to get, get past. And I think a lot of that has to do with the reptilian brain where we're still like 10,000 years ago in our psychology where we think that we're going to get eaten by a lion or we can't survive because um, um, I think technology has evolved so fast and our minds haven't adapted to it uh, in some way. You can think from the big ge geological, biological evolution thing. Uh, we're kind of, uh, as evolution happens, uh, we need to keep updating our minds to this. And right now with the digital age, there's a major, major software upgrade that people need in their own head because we have unprecedented and exploding technology that we can't keep up with. So, so. Uh, Collaborative literacy is the idea that we start to first think that, okay, we can solve more problems together than alone. We don't have to do things alone. There's plenty for everybody, and the world could be a, a much better place. So on a, on a practical front, so, you know, let's talk about material security and addressing, addressing uh, just the material survival, and that's what we work on. Open source ecology, global village construction set, building civilizations from scratch. Um, but how do we get a lot of people to collaborate? Yesterday we touched on the idea that um, it's also a lot about operations and revenue models and what's an actual model that can work to bring this into the economy as opposed to something that we, we just do as volunteers or uh, just something of a, of a hobby like you know, a, lot of, a lot of 3D printing is hobby printing but where is the actual economic impact and, and that means coordination, that means taking what Wikipedia does translating that to, to actual product development, which is completely feasible technically uh, in all ways. And here we're exploring how to do it. Uh, we're leading up to the incentive challenge, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, to, to show that open source development techniques can deliver quality products on schedule and getting people to actually get economic activity out of that as a replicable process instead of proprietary R&D. That's the big promise. So let's take a look at some of the tools that we use here. Um, I mean, just starting with the very basics, making the road by walking. I'm not saying we have any of the, the grand answers, but, but we do have processes that we've tried and done that, that work to do things like the extreme manufacturing if you, where, where you can build large machines in a day or, or a house in five days. I mean, we've shown things like that with the collaborative processes. We think that you can scale the, the practical development to thousands of people, like really meaningful collaborating. Um, without that uh, just exploding. Uh, how do we know that? So in Linux, when Git, the version control came out, I guess that was one of the mailing lists and Git was uh, <coughs> when Linux could actually organize the thousands of its contributors to make collaborative organized development. The version history is a big, big deal of that. How do you, uh, without conflicts, build upon other people's work and that's the kind of stuff we have to build in here so let's talk about how we do that uh, so to coordinate if we are in a workshop like right now or another event we start with a work lab so that uh, and a wiki so a wiki we know wikipedia one of the largest largest projects we know that kind of stuff works for scalable development uh, an unlimited number of people can be handled on a wiki uh, thousands uh, to the number of thousands so we do, what we do is start a work log um, on this page here, collaboration, protocol, and required assets. Um, so that page, I'll link that when, uh, when we uh, post this video. So basic things we do, start a work log, keep a timesheet, use these, um, publish early and often. Uh, you can see what, 
so if, if we have like say you know 12 people a dozen people or two like right now collaborating you have to kn know where the other people live on the wiki so one index page where you list all the logs would be a useful thing uh, so you can see what they're they're doing if you upload the w to the wiki or or update it you can see virtually even if they're not here what everyone is contributing to and then we set up common common repositories like um, part libraries on the wiki where there's a part the wiki itself has a version history if you upload a new part the old part still stays there so you can always go back to the the former versions that process is pretty much open to everybody um, you don't have like on the wiki there's very few protected pages like it's a it's a free-for-all in in a sense in the sense that uh, unlike say with git you have people accepting uh, you submit a pull request and then it's either accepted or not into the main branch here you're actually free to do that on a wiki you can start a project and no one's kind of monitoring you but then how do you get the coordination out of that well um, if people gravitate to that project <coughs> that means it gets developed if they don't it doesn't the way that information gets upgraded on a wiki is that um, over time it can improve if you um, if people c contribute to it but there is no gatekeeper right now the way that things get organized is like by maintainers people who, who would actually take responsibility for some set of pages like like the 3d printer or whatever and then they they can start uh, to to organize or index the information in a better way so it's more accessible but as the step number one you want to put everything on a wiki and then you can worry about that getting organized in the future uh, so there's a very loose kind of a commit mechanism on a wiki where anyone is able to do it like uh, you don't really have to ask for permission you all you need to do is get a get an account on the wiki so um, we don't have a, like a formal pull request kind of a deal but there are pages that are like official this is the main fork like if you're like I'm you know I'm maintaining a lot of on top of a lot of the projects but of course we want people to come in and say okay I'm gonna take care of be a maintainer for this this part or another part uh, so that it all comes together but you have to be aware of what's what work is is happening in order to do that. you have to be involved in a project to pretty much organize it in an effective way though anyone that that chooses to do so can do so we don't have pretty much any kind of restrictions on who can enter and collaborate um, going to so let's go to the basic OSC workflow that we use FreeCAD for the so when you talk about uh, design work FreeCAD is a, the open source premier CAD software that we have we also use OpenSCAD parametric software uh, but the basic workflow that which we'll actually get into today is to start a part library on a wiki and we can go over that uh, part libraries on the wiki where you we talk about breakdown so you take a machine like that say the 3d printer if you want to document it fully you would break it down into different modules like the controller like the axis like extruder and so forth and you can develop around that there's a page, uh, so for example, for the D3D Universal. Um, where is that on the wiki? It's a page called D3D Universal. You'll see part libraries where you have individual images of all the different uh, different parts, very granular. The key is to get it as granular as possible. So a part library would ideally have every single part, like down to every screw and component. And there's only like a hundred or so parts for the entire printer but a fully fledged library would be okay you actually get <clears throat> each part in there so it can be developed and continue to be developed then you have individual parts you have assemblies in the full machine so for the assemblies you can say okay this is an entire extruder for the individual parts you can see that say that okay that's the fan that's one of the 3d printed pieces and so forth but the modular breakdown is the key so if we had to say say we know what a printer like say we wanted the next iteration of this or maybe change it in a major way you can take uh, as many people as there are library parts and without any conflict 
have them like you know put a put a thousand or a thousand people uh, um, hundred people let's say for each part one person per part if you had a redesign that you had to make like say you had to make it like into a big printer you can take a hundred people over a day you can get them all to download the pre-cut files make the modifications upload them and continue going on that so the, the breakdown is a, is a big big concept um, so basic workflow is to download and upload files into part libraries, keep track of that on your work log so that other people know where to find it. Um, we have this 60 second rule which we're trying to keep to actually. So as soon as you have a free cut file, upload it. Don't wait till like the thing that we got to watch out for. In order to allow real time collaboration, do not wait to finish that. Upload it as soon as you can so somebody can uh, download them at the same time and say you go out for launch you can come back and say hey that somebody actually uploaded a new file but in a rapid uh, constraint time constraint process you want to upload as soon as you can don't wait till the end of the day don't wait till you think you have something because you're embarrassed to show what you have as work in progress um, do it because that allows you to to collaborate with others to help you and it's one of those things like don't do it yourself you don't have to do it yourself is the big point you can allow others to jump in but you have to have the self-esteem to to say i'm not afraid to do that so it's a psychological game where you have to shift your mindset from like oh it's all me to we're actually working together it's come on people we've got big issues that we need to solve on the planet let's work together and not not make a big deal out of like do we feel insecure about uploading our free cat file um, because we're working on much greater issues and we're all trying to support each other in order to do that. Um, so that's a 60 second rule. Like if we design, you know, say we do the motor holder for the, uh, if we do the CNC C drill, uh, yeah, first person that starts that file, you know, say we're, you know, maybe someone like started it right now because someone's ambitious, itching to do it. Uh, yeah, upload it right away and then when we actually start it, you see, oh wow, there's already a part that's seeded or there's a wiki page that started for that project so as if people are aware of that overall process then things can just start start coming into place and that's the kind of uh, what we're trying to generate through the the steam camp to the kind of literacy so more points of how we do things so a lot of times we like to embed google presentations in the wiki because they're live editable docs like the wiki you can have an edit conflict two people cannot edit the same page at the same time you can do infinite number of people in Google Docs. That's a very useful thing. We'd like to have an open source alternative to Google Docs. We don't yet. Now, the big one is Wiki Taxonomy. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, but there's, uh, there's a whole page on Wiki Taxonomy. How are things named? That's a big question. Like, if, if you, everybody knows what a thing is named, then you can get to that piece of knowledge and upgrade it um, like that. Now, the wiki taxonomy, actually, by the way, we break things down into projects, so there's machines, modules, sub-modules, and there's development steps, and there's versions. So on the wiki, there should be about 240,000 content pages for the 50 machines. So if we're talking about the Global Village construction set, and I go through that. Uh, but within a few seconds, like a second or two, you should be able to, to access any of that. For example, 3D printer or D3D universal bill of materials. You know, that's one out of many. And then you can trace that through, okay, if this is the first D3D universal, we can say, okay, then there's versions and there's a method of how we do the versioning. So look at the wiki taxonomy page. Um, part of the taxonomy is uh, all the development steps and that's a development template. You can take a look at that link. Um, part libraries I mentioned a little bit about we also include a visual history where you just simply upload a, a snapshot of a file work in progress so that people can get oriented really about, okay, this is the design evolution of this, this little thing. So we're just manually doing that. Uh, visual history. So take a look at that. Um, and then use open source software for infinite access. I won't go too much into that. Uh, then we, at the end of the day, we end up publishing manuals, which uh, use the RSC manual template and so forth. So, so the basic idea is know how to name everything, uh, have the, the courage to upload things as soon as you can for massive collaborative processes and go from there. 
There's a page called Collaborative Literacy on the wiki. It's got a couple of nice videos on it. So take a look at Collaborative Literacy wiki page. I've got an interview with the guy who actually coined that word. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, cool guy. Um, he runs, basically, his life is about how do we get people to collaborate. But yeah, Collaborative Literacy is a big word and he's the first, this one, uh, Eugene Kim is the guy that coined that term and is uh, working with Wikipedia. So know how to name things, know the basic FreeCAD workflow, start your log on the wiki, and <coughs> upload as soon as you can. This is the basic kind of principle, and we'll practice all of this, so like we'll, we'll get to like as soon as we start any of the design after we're getting the printer running, we'll start, uh, make sure everybody has the work log, and then, so the tactical thing is make sure you start the work log, then we'll have one page, the Steam Cam page, so there's already a page like that. Um, it's The shortcut to it, I think, is J. Uh, J for January 2020 Steam Camp um, on the wiki. We'll index, just put a link to everybody's log so that when we know, say, um, you know, Chris, say you're, you're doing your new iteration of the, of the 3D printed linear bearing, we can now implement it right here and, and do it. Um, we know where to find it. It's, I'm gonna go to Chris Log. Or I'm going to go to Shang log, and we can find it. And so, so the number one thing is like you, we know that there's certain. I want I want people to know who. That's why I want to show the faces and Facebook splattered all over Facebook, mm -hmm. because then we can say Jessica log. Oh, okay, I know she's doing stuff, and I can identify by her. I, I remember her. Mm -hmm. So that if I don't remember, like what the hell was that? I can say, oh, that was that's from Jessica log, uh -huh. and I'll find it. So make different, think about different cues of how you can coordinate with people that you haven't seen or you have seen. Look at the video so you can make yourself personable to people um, and start to collaborate on a massive scale. And here when we say massive scale, we're talking about, um, so for the incentive challenge that we're going to offer the September 1st, big date for us, 2,000 people meaningful collaborating. So we're not talking about like a dozen, this is not, I'm not talking about a dozen people here. I'm talking about thousands. The scale that Linux has done right now, Linux, if you look at their stats, they've got about a couple of thousand full-time developers right now. How do they do it? They, they get companies to pay for that. We don't have that yet, that's what we're working towards, the open source micro factories, uh, the potential new engine of production will provide those financial feedback loops. What we will see, uh, pretty much guaranteed, just like with Linux, once our products are top, state of art, uh, and we're getting there uh, inch by inch, say with an enclosed high temperature 3D <coughs> printer, I think we're gonna make some waves with that. Then companies are gonna start coming to us, hey, I want that, and they're gonna start funding that and so forth. So companies, individuals, startups, we focus really on the entrepreneurial uh, entities, but it's going to be just natural that in the future there's going to be companies and everybody else that's coming to us saying, hey, um, we'll fund you because you're actually doing effective innovation. So that's how we see it. If we all learn this, this is how we're going to uh, become desirable um, because we have developed an effective process for collaboration. And that's a, that's a big deal because right now that doesn't exist for hardware uh, in software it does exist, but once again, it's as I mentioned yesterday, it is not collaborative. It's a lot of the software is open. It's not collaborative. People all then compete. They have used the open core. Then they all compete to create more problems on the planet. So that major shift of everything turning towards an ethical economy that's up to us, we can't expect the corporation to do it because that's not what it's designed for so um, really uh, we got to learn the collaborative <coughs> literacy and the powerful open tools that exist already we're we're so set we got to take advantage of it because there are no technological bounds or first principle energy bounds by which which say that this is not going to happen the, ch the future is ours so um, let's do this and we'll collaborate on doing simple uh, evolutions of little products and we'll keep scaling that until we have a lot of different steam camps happening at the same time. I think one of our challenges right now, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, the internet here, this is not really working, like we can't really get too much um, like stream all day, but 
we got to figure out how we can have like even the stuff like about the mics mm -hmm. like the sound quality because we can't like i can't be on headphones because other people wouldn't hear it so how do we do that we have to figure out like into this collaborative protocol and required assets is like okay what is the AV infrastructure we need to make this happen and, and guarantee that this produces good results because I think we kind of lost some people yesterday. Um, and yeah, we got to just figure all those aspects out. So in addition to, okay, here's the wiki and, and Google Docs and so forth, like we really got to nail the, the AV um, as far as how to do it. So that's one of the things we should add to our collaborative protocol of how we really address it and open source it using open tools. I'm hoping actually that the Raspberry Pi tablet may give us some insight into that. Like when we have uh, more of these time lapses happening everywhere and we're documenting uh, more. So yeah, just building up step by step to, to all these different things. So any thoughts and questions before we get started? We'll, we'll get, uh, we're ready to run the printers here, just wire them up, uh, which is exciting. So we'll get our first prints, it's gonna be cool. Um, uh, any, any comments or questions? What, any discussion? Any thoughts or uh, a lot of thoughts? Um, at what point do you think the documentation by Wiki will no longer scale? I don't think there's, that's not scalable. <coughs> Why do you think I mean, it will not scale? Technically, it, it is scalable. Technically, it's scalable. Yes. When the manager, but that's not really what I'm much. asking. Yeah, is mm -hmm. I mean, well, well let's get is, you know, like you mentioned, like really, really impactful. So mm -hmm. we are sort of rolling our own Git, uh, but it's very manual. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's also very dependent on, you know, uploads and downloads of large files. I say large files, you know, comparatively, you know, since we can't submit uh, changes on files, you know, as, uh, commit to a repository, mm. um, you know, having multiple people in a rural area like this with, you know, sort of mediocre bandwidth uh, is going to be a deterrent. And so if the goal is to be able to spread these experiences in as, you know, far and wide and diverse as locations as possible, that will be a technical scaling problem eventually. Uh, I mean, besides just the process <coughs> I think concept that now you're getting to the point though where if you want to be able to go to businesses and say you know yeah we can print you great stuff um, you have to have some kind of like test cases that like you have to validate that when you say I have a file that um, is good that the end product comes out you know good <coughs> um, you know, I think test cases are going to be sort of jigs or forms or, you know, something that is created alongside a product to prove that, you know, each module at least does, you know, what the plans say it does. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, there's a whole concept in software development called test-driven development. And, mm -hmm. you know, you build tests first and then build software around it, right? Yeah. So, obviously, in, you know, prototyping, that's not necessarily helpful because you're just creating a bunch of, you know, rework to yourself. But as you get into flagship products, um, you know, you have to think about the production scale of every, or the production quality of every print that comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how, how do we teach people who are getting into this world to think about that? You know, that's, again, the same concept in software, mm -hmm. like when you're teaching young developers to write software, you want to teach them how to think about software in a testable way, so that because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a you know construct that's really you know valuable and important. So how do we teach that concept you know in hardware? Well, you start with the test-driven development page on the OSC wiki. Mm -hmm. We're all yeah. over that actually. Cool. So when we yeah design the test, so for example, like if we're yeah yeah test-driven development is a big topic. I guess we don't need to get into right. that right now, but for example, the test-driven development on the tractor is design a test for, say, like physically motion of the loader arms by 3D printing. That's your test right there. You're designing that before you do any building. <coughs> so, yes, you can do a lot of that. Um, for scalability, like the ultimate question of scalability, I think 
the thing is understanding some of the there is a complexity of understanding the overall processes and I don't know how long you can do the the kind of like the manual version of version control yeah. but when you look at software too any of the revisions at the end of the day are manual in some way because someone has to approve them right so there is like very inherent limits to that that kind of process too we've got a little bit more uh, it sounds like it's at least little... streamlined so if you're gonna apply the, the knowledge work of 20 people let's say and but each of them are going to keep their own work logs and each of them are going to post sort of status updates over time some human still has to sort of merge that back to master and decide that okay this is sort of the best we've come up with we're going to you know make a major version change you know to this product and implement this you know back to master you're still doing that work except you're also expending so much time and mental you know knowledge work on all these separate you know work logs now if you consider technically each of those a separate product because different people are contributing to them and there's a serves a different individual purpose that's a different sort of line of thinking um, but as the collaborative part goes at least mm -hmm. you have to identify very very specifically what you're collaborating on as a group if we are all you know across the world right now in this camp collaborating on you know one product it would be very, very laborious to manage separate work logs for that and then at some ambiguous time decide, okay, well now we're going to merge that some pieces of this back into master and have this whole spaghetti um, merging between branches, so to speak, before you even get back to master. So there's a bunch of different um, concepts of just sort of... Um, Sort of get flow or you know feature control over time in terms of how you merge these concepts together knowing that your end goal is to get to you know master and have something that is you know deployable as a production ready um, mm -hmm. set of plans mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of looking to see at least mentally I'm my eyes are open to where does this work log concept start to break down or is it really simply just our own manual repos but at the same time, if we're all managing different repos toward one end game product, now we're managing one product across a whole bunch of different repositories, which gets tricky because then you're getting into like a microservice model and you have to be able to, you know, script or somehow um, with high precision merge all of these different versions uh, of all these different products together so maybe the y-axis the z-axis the extruder um, all these different things into a full product it's deployable and production ready so yeah we can get into that part yeah. of the time well, it sounds like right. you're a great candidate for starting that page um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's true. Yeah. <clears throat> now the second part well, is just real I, quick i mean a lot of it's about culture Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest part, you know, is people adopting a particular pattern. Right. What comes normal? I mean, with software designers, it's a culture. Yeah, it's not something you can go to school for. It's something that you have to practice. Right. So I think, you know, as you begin to practice, you find out what works. And I think the whole thing is we can't get lost in some of the details. We need to guess like what's most efficient. I mean, the whole purpose of hacking is to say, look, this too long. Yeah. So I think it's a matter right. of right. So I'm not trying to suggest anything. No, 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 no. No, I understand. But that. I'm definitely. My eyes are open to like. Yeah. There's an opportunity to maybe improve this process so that there's less manual work, there's less long-term <coughs> scalability. Well, one of the things yeah, as far as workspace, I mean, like you said, getting a workspace that's, you know, kind of set workspace that has multiple cameras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, then, and speakers. And, right, yeah. and then yeah. Yeah. visual monitors and documentation. Like if you have, you know, big screens, I mean, big screen televisions are cheap. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying if you could have, like, even on, on actually on the table itself, and then you have a class, class of written, you can put your parts on there. Oh, yeah. You know wow. what I'm talking about? So maybe you can imagine this a flat screen television. You had a plexiglass on here. Yeah. And then all you have to do is pull up, and you can manually do it like your part, that part goes here, that part goes there, that part goes there. So visual workspace. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, like visual um, workspace. Augmented reality. I started reading about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so. And then, 
you really need to print a lot of these 3D printed wallets to handle all the Bitcoin that you're going to have to put into them. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. No, but on a serious, more serious note, on addressing the issue, yes, there's this whole complexity of parts, but the modularity too. Like, say we're developing the products that are on Amazon. <clears throat> each one of them, each mechatronic device, a vacuum cleaner, you know, whatever, cordless drill, drone, those are like, you can have a community around that as long as they have the umbrella of collaborative literacy towards a common goal of a post-scarcity economy, they can work seamlessly and they don't have to interact too much, but we know that there's this wealth of repository that's being created um, in like uh, granular groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that that scalability, I think that's that's like unlimited and then Wiki can handle that. Certainly. Yeah. 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 yeah? That's good. Good discussions, yeah. A visual workflow, I'd like to see more of that. Um, okay. Excellent. So let's let's get going. We'll we'll um, do we wanna check back in later in the evening tonight or or should we call it for should we set up a later time in the day or just uh, because you guys think that you might uh, get to the pen plotter today? Because we're going to try to do that. Um. Awesome. We're going to work on some free coding uh, work on attachment. We were thinking we might move in after the uh, um, initial free CAD uh, work. I want to work a little bit on a CNC, like a spindle mount, like a mount for the 5x5 uh, the, the motor because uh, okay. a CNC milling. That, uh, um, that we thought would be really, really pretty cool. That, that, that's cool. Yeah, so maybe you guys like focus on uh, you guys get us the design because we've got the same parts here, right? You've got, you're talking about the 555 motor. Right. Yeah. Maybe first, like uh, just a, a handle for it, as if you are a handheld going to do it, but then with the eye of making it so that it could be quick attach so that yeah. we could yeah, yeah. Uh, move to putting it onto the D3D. No, that's cool because actually the motor just with a little drill bit as a little manual bit, uh, manual drill, yeah. that's cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. Drum, uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and we'll probably, let's see if we can do the plotter here. You guys do the mill. Uh, that'll be awesome. See what we can come up with. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, watch out for our, yeah, take a look at our, our uh, Keep an eye on our, our work log. We'll do the same for, for you guys. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of trying, trying to think of the work log as more of um, uh, an index of the work index. that I'm working on. But it's always a duplicate of you know it should be a duplicate of the work where it actually or linked to where it should live. You know, for this, for example, we'd say, hey, look, I'm working on the, uh, this attachment. Uh, it's a link to it here in my work log, but by the way, it's where it should be on the parts library on the D3D version. Right, the work log is an indexing thing. Yeah, the cool thing about the wiki is like you can throw a bunch of stuff up, but it's all about the quality of it comes from the indexing, the post-processing of that, um, and anyone can index um, to upgrade the quality so you know where to find stuff. Very cool. So, um, should we um, should we meet again tomorrow or check in, in a, later in the day? I'd be curious to check in later today because if we run in.